Hello everyone, welcome. I am Jet Aguilar from the Astronomical League of the Philippines, and I will be hosting this uh, today's webinar. Thank you so much for joining us for our 2023 Astronomy Expert Speaker Series online lecture. We are fortunate to have with us today as our speaker, none other than the director of the Vatican Observatory at Castel Gandolfo, Italy. I will never forget our speaker's name because I have very fond memories of his writing. In particular, he was the one who gently introduced me to the hobby of astronomy through his very popular book, Turn Left at Orion, which I bought 20 years ago and I still have now. Today, he will talk to us about a very interesting topic, Vesta and the chaotic formation of planets. 10 years ago, NASA's Dawn mission was sent to asteroid Vesta to inspect up close an intact protoplanet from the dawn of the solar system, except Vesta's overall density is too low and its core and crust too big to fit anything like what we expect an intact protoplanet to look like. Instead, Vesta is giving us new clues to planet formation and evolution in a violent early solar system. My fellow ALP member, Ms. Imelda Joson will be doing the introduction for our esteemed speaker later. For those who are not able to register, but would still want to watch this ongoing webinar, we are currently live streaming on Facebook at the Facebook page of the Philippine Astronomy Forum. Before we start, kindly allow me to explain some rules for this webinar to help us make this an enjoyable learning experience for all. Please listen and do your best to give your undivided attention to our speaker. There will be a short question and answer session at the end of the lecture. You may type in your questions either under the Q&A tab found in your Zoom interface at any point during the presentation. We will do our best to read and answer your questions live after the lecture or via the Q&A tab. We would like to remind everyone that the contents presented in this webinar will remain as the individual property of the lecturer and the photographers in the presentation. We will also be distributing certificates of attendance via email to all registered attendees who will be present with us throughout the webinar. So please use the name you have written in your registration forms to help us facilitate this process. So enjoy the webinar and let us all have fun learning. Here's the program flow for today's webinar. And now I would like to turn you over to Mr. James Kevin T the President of the Astronomical League of the Philippines to give his welcome remarks. You have to unmute yourself, James. Oh, sorry. Uh, good evening to our viewers in the Philippines and good morning to our guests in the United States and Europe. My name is James Cavity, President of the Astronomical League of the Philippines. On behalf of the ALP, I would like to welcome you all to our Astronomy Experts Speaker Series 2023. This webinar is part of the ALP's International Astronomy Educational Outreach Program. Our goal is to bring renowned experts and scientists to the Filipino people and to the rest of the world. That is why the webinar is being offered free to the general public. I would like to take this opportunity also to thank ALP members who have been instrumental in putting this program all together, especially Imelda Joson, Edwin Aguirre, Dr. Jet Aguilar, June Lau, Kendrick Cole, KCT, Andrew Ian Chan, and Peter Benedict Tobalinal. So this will be the 16th lecture in our speaker series. Our speaker for today is no other than Brother Guy, Consel Magno, SJ, Director of Vatican Observatory. We have more distinguished speakers lined up for the coming months. So please stay with us uh, and please do not forget to register in advance for these future webinars. Thank you very much. And now I would like to turn over the program to Imelda Joson, who will introduce our guest speaker for today. Thank you so much, James, and welcome everyone. Again, as James said, good morning, good day, and good evening to everybody. In 1999, Edwin and I were invited to speak at the Vatican Observatory at the Pontifical Palace at Castel Gandolfo in Italy. 
There we were met by Brother Guy Consolmagno, a young, very enthusiastic Jesuit who was then the curator of the Vatican Meteorite Collection and who, was, who so kindly showed us the very impressive collection. We also got to spend much time with Brother Guy during a field trip to Florence, Siena, and San Geminiano, where we were seatmates in the bus throughout the trip. I remember Brother Guy, we had to check everybody. You know, uh, it was our responsibility to check uh, our seatmates, and we always had to try to find you because you were <laughs> behind us. Uh, so, Brother Guy Consolmagno, SJ, is the director of the Vatican Observatory and a planetary scientist studying meteorites and asteroids. A native of Detroit, Michigan, he received his bachelor's and master's degree from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, or MIT, and PhD from the University of Arizona, all in the field of planetary science. He entered the Jesuit order in 1989 and joined the staff of the Vatican Observatory in 1993. Along with more than 200 scientific publications, he is the author of several popular books on astronomy and the relationship between faith and science. In 2014, he was recognized by the American Astronomical Society's Division of Planetary Sciences with the Carl Sagan Medal for Excellence in Public Communication in Planetary Sciences. In 2000, the International Astronomical Union named asteroid 1983 UA1 as 4597 Consolmagno in his honor. Ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome, direct from Italy, Brother Guy. It's great to be here. Thank you all for having me. So I hope you can see the opening uh, slide there. It looks good. Okay, then I will proceed. From my very earliest times, I've been fascinated by a particular kind of meteorite, which are called basaltic meteorites, and possibly their connection to asteroid Vesta. So it all goes back to our understanding of how the planets were formed. And the idea since the time of Immanuel Kant was that planets are formed out of a cloud of gas and dust that eventually is collapsing and forming a disk because centrifugal force stops the collapse in the, in the plane of the spin. <clears throat> but the top and the bottom can collapse into a disk. You get the star in the center, and then all the other bits of dust grow into planets. About 20 years ago, it was realized that the giant planets, which for many reasons we knew were going to be forming first, might wind up in a resonance with each other, and their orbits could be moving them in so that, as you can see in the little picture there, um, when Jupiter moves in, it will scatter all of the other planetesimals, and especially the material that was originally going to be in the asteroid belt, gets scattered out to the Oort cloud and, and, or into the sun. And that's why there is a gap between where the terrestrial planets end and Jupiter begins. Could it be that there is anything left over of the original planetesimals that were forming? Well, only the largest probably would survive. And in terms of size, it's thought the two largest, you know, we're not quite sure about the size of Pallas, but certainly Ceres is very big. It's, you know, <clears throat> twice the radius of any other asteroid. Nowadays, we're not even sure it is an asteroid. It might be it's what we call a dwarf planet. Maybe it even comes from the, the Kuiper belt. We didn't know about the Kuiper belt back then. But certainly, <clears throat> Vesta, as an asteroid, looked remarkably different from any other asteroid. And we had good reason to believe that it was an intact protoplanet. This is what a typical asteroid looks like. It's a pile of rubble. This is what the Japanese spacecraft Hayabusa imaged about 20 years ago. And you can see the rubble, and you can see that, that it's not round. It's a bunch of lumps loosely held together by gravity, but it's so small that its own internal gravity is not big enough to pull it into a spherical shape. This is asteroid Bennu, which is even smaller. It's you know a few hundred meters across. And even though it looks kind of roundish, it's only because it's a pile of rubble that's spinning really, really fast. 
<clears throat> and the, the rubble has sort of slid down and bits and pieces are flying off the equator. This is the one that we've sampled, the Americans have sampled with the OSIRIS-REx spacecraft, and those materials should be coming back to Earth in September. But again, we know that's rubble. That's not, asteroids are not big rocks in space. They're piles of rock. And the question, of course, is were they ever big rocks? Apparently, we are looking at the remains of stuff that got broken up and put back together, maybe broken up and put back together many times. And that's why the idea that Vesta could be intact, never broken up, never put back together, was so exciting. Now, I want to tell you a little bit about meteorites so you know where I'm coming from when I talk about the basaltic meteorites compared to ordinary chondrites. <clears throat> a chondrite is called a chondrite because it has chondrules. Chondrules are those little beads of rock that you see on the left-hand side of this picture in the middle. And that's, you know, sitting on top of a ruler where those are millimeter hashes. So they're a millimeter to less than a millimeter across. They're tightly packed together with a lot of dust and a lot of flakes of metal. But if you measure the chemical compositions of these meteorites, you find that they're formed into minerals called plagioclase and pyroxene and olivine. And then there's the nickel iron bits. And then there's even pieces of iron sulfide. And the proportions of the iron versus the magnesium versus the silicon that you find in these meteorites is the same proportion you see in the sun. So this makes you think that what we're looking at is the raw material that made the sun and ultimately made the planets. But of course, it's not what you see on the, on the surface of the earth because all the iron is drained into the core and all, all this olivine has made itself into a mantle. And then there are these interesting basaltic meteorites. They're called achondrites because they don't have the little beads. Instead, when you look at them close up, they've got crystals big crystals of plagioclase and pyroxene that are tightly <clears throat> woven together as if they crystallize together out of a lava. And these meteorites don't have any olivine and they don't have any nickel iron and they don't have any sulfide. In that sense, they're not all that different from the rocks that you see on the surface of the moon and the rocks that you see on the surface of the earth except the earth is a whole lot more complicated because the rocks continue to go through volcanoes and continue to evolve and react with atmospheres and all the other things that obviously never happened on a small asteroid like where these guys come from. These are basalts because they look like lavas that come out of a volcano and a lava that comes out of a volcano and crystallizes is what we call a basalt and they're achondrites because they don't have chondrules and the A means not if you speak Greek. Now, I mentioned some minerals, and I apologize if you're, um, you know, astronomers, you're not used to minerals. Mineralogy is actually, for, when it comes to, to meteorites, is pretty simple. Minerals are based on the chemical composition and the crystal structure. You know, the most common elements in the sun are silicon, magnesium, iron, aluminum, calcium, sodium, potassium. Not counting, obviously, hydrogen and helium and carbon and oxygen, but those make up gases. The most common elements that are going to make up rocks are these guys. And because oxygen is more common than anything else after hydrogen and helium, the oxygen is going to react with these guys so that the potassium will be potassium oxide and the silicon will be silicon dioxide and the magnesium will be magnesium oxide. And then you just have to assemble the potassium oxides and the silicon oxides and the aluminum oxides into a different form that will make minerals. Now, three big kinds of minerals. Feldspars, of which plagioclase is the most common, because there's not so much K, there's not so much potassium, there's a whole lot more sodium, the Na, and calcium, the Ca. And oddly enough, on the moon and in these meteorites, there's not a whole lot of sodium. So it's really all just anorthite. And if you remember you know, hearing about moon rocks being rich in anorthothite, that's what they're talking about, the plagioclase that's rich in calcium. There is another kind of mineral called pyroxene. And some of these pyroxenes are just magnesium with silicon oxides or iron oxide with silicon dioxide or a mixture of magnesium and iron with silicon dioxide. However, you can also throw in a calcium oxide 
and turn the orthopyroxene into clinopyroxene. And the difference just tells you about the, the mineral shape. Of all of those guys up there, however, the by far the most abundant is silicon. That's why most rocks are made of silicon dioxide and other oxides. They're called silicates. And then you've got magnesium and iron and everything else is maybe a tenth as abundant. So you would expect the overwhelming majority of rock to be made out of magnesium oxide plus the silicon dioxide or iron oxide with the uh, silicon dioxide. And to make the structure work, you actually <clears throat> will have two magnesiums and two irons because there's that much iron or magnesium available. And the iron and the magnesium can substitute with each other. So you can have a whole range of forsterite rich to phaolite rich, but it's all olivine. And it's called olivine because if you look at the mineral, it's green, it's olive green. Some of you who are you know, into gems might know it as peridot, same stuff. So really, the only minerals you have to know are plagioclase and pyroxene and olivine. When you have a mixture of these three, the mixture will melt. And the stuff that melts first is about half pyroxene, about half plagioclase. And they melt before the olivine does. So they are the stuff that goes up to the surface to be basalts, and the olivine is left behind in the center of the planet as the pyroxene and the plagioclase goes off to the surface. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> basaltic meteorites are the stuff from the surface. And since all the iron's been drained off into the core by this melting, and all the olivine is left behind in the mantle, they're only the pyroxene and the plagioclase, so not surprisingly, they don't represent solar abundances or cosmic abundances. They are the result of this melt melting, this differentiation. The chondrites look kind of like the sun. The basaltic chondrites absolutely don't. Just as an example, in the ordinary chondrites, the aluminum to silicon ratio, <clears throat> the ratio of the oxides, is about 6%. But in the basalts of a basaltic meteorite, it's more like 20%, because all of the aluminum is tied up in the plagioclase, and the plagioclase is the stuff that melts and goes to the surface. So all of the aluminum is extracted out of the planet and put onto the surface. And if you the ratio, you realize that if you started with cosmic abundances, you would expect a crust to be 25 to 30% of the volume of the parent body because that's what would happen if you pulled all of the aluminum and concentrated into the surface, or the, at least the top layer. And so you expect, if I had a body that started with solar abundances, you know, a body made out of chondrites, and I melt it, about 25% of the crust, well, about 25% of it will be crust, and that crust will be rich in all of the aluminum. Now, the interesting thing about these basalts is that when you look at them in, in, in visible light, there is a particular color, but in particular, when you look into the near infrared at about 9.95 microns, there is this big dark gap. And that tells you that you've got uh, basalts. In fact, it comes from the iron in the pyroxenes. When you look at the spectrum of various basaltic meteorites, you can plot those basaltic meteorites right on top of the spectrum of Vesta. I was an undergraduate at MIT when people first started doing this. A guy named um, Tom McCord did this. And he had the spectrum of the meteorites that they had taken in the lab. He went to the telescope and he took the spectrum of Vesta and he saw, oh my gosh, the one fits right on top of the other. This is amazing. We're going to be able to go look at asteroids and tell what they're made out of. It was the first one they looked at because Vesta was the brightest of the asteroids because it's got this light white color because that's what pyroxene and plagioclase gives you. Unfortunately, this is the only asteroid that looks like this. And it's the only asteroid where the fit was so easy to do for a whole lot of reasons I don't need to go into. Nonetheless, the fit does work. 
you look at the surface of Vesta and it looks just like it's covered with basalt. So here you've got, you know, the second biggest asteroid, maybe the biggest if you don't count Ceres, and it looks like it's got a surface that ex exactly what you would expect if you had a body that started like chondrites, melted, <clears throat> and it covered the surface with basalt. Seems a whole lot like it might be <clears throat> an intact body. Vesta is essentially unique. There are some tiny asteroids that look like they were chipped off of Vesta. But for the major asteroids, <clears throat> Vesta looks different from the other asteroids, which mostly look like chondrites. We actually have these pieces of chondrites. We can show <clears throat> from the melting in the isotopes that these were formed early, like four and a half billion years ago. These are some of the oldest of the meteorites. So we've got this body that's you know, big enough that it could melt. It's covered with melt. When we, have, when we look at the rocks that came out of the melt, it looks like those are among the oldest rocks and nothing has happened to them since. And you've got this wonderful vision that Vesta at the very least looks like an intact body that melted and gave us meteorites that are like the basaltic meteorites. Now, is it possible that the basaltic meteorites may have come from someplace else as well? After all, the basaltic meteorite body should be 25% crust, but about 60% of this olivine that was originally there but got left behind, and then you've got this you know, iron core like you would see. <clears throat> if you were to have an asteroid that was the size of Vesta, <clears throat> or any size, and broke up, you would expect to see about six olivine meteorites for every two and a half basaltic meteorites, because that's the proportion, or 12 iron meteorites for every five basaltic meteorites. In fact, we have 2,500 basaltic meteorites of this type in our collections. So if I, these came from a body that had been completely broken up, you would expect to see 6,000 olivine meteorites and you don't. You don't see any. Some people have argued maybe one or two possible meteorites might possibly be mantles. We're not quite sure, and they don't actually even look exactly like we would think a mantle meteorite to look like. In any event, we don't see 6,000. We only see the crust stuff. We don't see the mantle stuff. So, we know the basaltic meteorite body was big because it had to be big enough to melt. It melted only once. We know that because we can tell from the radioactive elements <clears throat> and the proportions in, in the meteorites that they only melted once a long time ago at the beginning of the solar system. The 75% olivine metal mantle would be hidden from view if the body was intact. That means that we would only see the crust and if the body is intact, then that would also mean that impacts would only be chipping off the top of this body, and it would never apparently chip deep enough to dig into and get olivine meteorites. And Vesta is the only large, presumably intact asteroid that has the spectrum of these basaltic meteorites. HEDs are basaltic meteorites. I'm using the term interchangeably. There are some small ones that look like basalts, but you can trace their orbits back to where Vesta is. And you can convince yourself <clears throat> that these are just chips that have been knocked off of Vesta. And from that, we conclude the HED meteorites, the basaltic meteorites had to come from an intact protoplanet. Vesta is an intact protoplanet with the right kind of surface. Vesta is the only intact protoplanet with the right kind of surface. Therefore, Vesta must be the source of these meteorites, and it must be an intact protoplanet. The guy who came up with this idea, not particularly trustworthy, he was a grad student. He was about 23 years old. <clears throat> Didn't do much after that. That was me. That was one of my papers published in 1977 and widely quoted ever since. So much so that when they were putting together this mission to look for intact bodies, 
they quoted that and said, okay, that's why we're going to build a spacecraft to go to Vesta. But even then, because I had come up with the idea, I also knew where the holes in the argument were. For instance, we've got more than a thousand iron meteorites. We've got 50 different kinds of iron meteorites that look like they came from 50 different kinds of protoplanets, not even just 50, but 50 kinds. The iron meteorites look like they are the cores of a protoplanet that has been completely broken up. Well, I said, you know, the HEDs couldn't come from there because where it's the olivine, but certainly we've got the pieces of the crust. Maybe all the rest of the rock got battered to bits just because of all those collisions in the early solar system, it turned into dust and were left only with the iron cores and Vesta was the lucky one that, ne that never happened to. The HEDs, the, the, they're not the only kinds of basaltic meteorites. We do have a few relatively rare basaltic meteorites. Uh, some called angrites, some called uralites, some called arborites. Not a whole lot of them, you know, not thousands of them like we have for the HEDs. And we don't have a Vesta for them. We don't know where they come from. Um, maybe it's just because we haven't looked hard enough and there's a whole lot of stuff out there that we haven't seen yet. Maybe. We also have an interesting number, again, not thousands, but not insignificant, of meteorites that are a mixture of stone and iron. The palisites look like that olivine and the metal. Maybe the metal held the olivine together to stop it from being broken into, you know, battered into bits. And we're looking at the very top of the core of a differentiated asteroid that was completely destroyed. But it means there must be a whole lot of them too, along with all the iron bits that are presumably the cores of meteorite of asteroids that were melted. And then we've got these really weird ones, which are mesositerites. And it looks like the basalt, like we would think would be on the surface, along with sheets of metal that run through it, as if these guys had run into liquid metal at some point. Well, certainly it was a violent place. And there might have been these, but, but, but yeah, where did these guys, where have these guys been hiding in the asteroid belt? Because they can't come from Vesta. So there must be some other bodies. Finally, and this is a kind of a subtle thing. There's three isotopes of oxygen in, in space. Oxygen 16 is the most common. It's got eight protons and eight neutrons in its nucleus. The eight protons are what make it oxygen. That gives, you know, with the eight, eight electrons, it gives it the chemical properties. But you can have eight protons and nine neutrons and make oxygen 17, or eight protons and 10 neutrons and make oxygen 18. They're much rarer, but they exist. On Earth, there is a ratio, what we call, you know, delta 17. That if you chemically sort out the oxygen 17 from the 16, whatever could sort it out was going to sort out the 18 from the 16 twice as much. So the ratio will always stay the same. The ratio of these isotopes in other meteorites follows that rule, but it's at a different ratio than the ratio of Earth. All of the HED basaltic meteorites fall on that line in the bottom of the phrase there, except for the ones that don't. And there's a couple that don't. There's a meteorite called Passamonte. And its oxygen isotopes look a little bit different, like it didn't come from the parent body of all the other guys. And one that was found in Antarctica, Allen Hills 86, 86, which looks different. And then another one called Ibiteria that <clears throat> looks even more different. That's kind of curious. So the vast majority of the HEDs, that's for high, HED comes from <clears throat> um, uh, the three major types of basalts that you find in this, you know, which is <clears throat> eucrites and diogenites, the two kinds. And then if you mix the two of them together, you get a third kind we call a howardite. So that's the HED. Almost all the HEDs look like they come from the same place, but some clearly don't. So there's a whole lot of reasons to think that that easy picture that everything comes from Vesta is a little bit too easy. 
because the iron meteorites have to come from someplace and not Vesta because Vesta is still there. There are these other rare achondrites that have to come from someplace and they're different from Vesta. And there's some basaltic achondrites that have different oxygen isotopes, which means they come from someplace different from Vesta. If we can't argue that everything comes from Vesta, but that there are other parent bodies out there, then maybe the whole reason we thought Vesta was intact is because the olivine is so well hidden, but these other guys have got to come from places that have olivine that we can't see, but it isn't hidden either. If there's another way of hiding the olivine, then maybe that link that all the basaltic meteorites come from Vesta has got a problem. Nonetheless, <clears throat> the Dawn mission was going to go to Ceres, which they thought was intact, and it's going to go to Vesta, which is intact. It's going to see what, what was left over, the last two bits that didn't get broken up in the wild early stages, the chaotic formation of the solar system. <clears throat> and the questions that we hope Dawn would answer was, ah, does it work? Can I make Vesta from this very simple process where you have cosmic dust with the same proportions as you have in the sun. It falls together into a rock about 400 kilometers across. <clears throat> it differentiates, it warms up, and the basalt goes to the top, and the iron core goes to the bottom. We can actually, with the spacecraft, measure how much the density is, and even from the gravity field, how big the core is. Does it have a core? If it does have a core, how big is the core? <clears throat> Maybe we could even figure out some way of figuring out how thick the crust was just by, you know, imaging there if we're really lucky. Let's take a look. Well, there is our image of Vesta. Odd thing is, first of all, it's not round. It's more shaped like a football. Well, maybe when it was really molten, it was spinning fast and it kind of flattened out. But it's also got these strange cracks around the equator, which... I wonder what that's all about. Anyway, we can measure its mass because we see how it deflects the spacecraft when it was in orbit. We can measure its mean radius, which is 260. As I say, it's about 500 kilometers across. From the volume, we can work out the density to you know, four significant places. And we work out that the core has to range from about 120 kilometers across if it was made out of metal to 160 kilometers across, it was made out of iron sulfide. It's probably some number in between. But absolutely, the surface is covered with basaltic meteorites. You don't see any olivine anywhere on the surface. You never see olivine. You just see the basaltic meteorites. OK, that's kind of what we expected. However, notice that funny flattened shape. And if you look more carefully, at the bottom, this is that same thing only twisted around. When you look at the South Pole, the, the colors here tell you depth from the center. There are, in fact, two big circular depressions. It looks like the South Pole of Vesta was impacted not once, by, but twice by something really big that dug down pretty deep. And the modelers can tell you how deep into the crust that impact must have struck. Let's start by, by assuming that Vesta was what we thought it was, made up of a chondrite, the most common chondrites are the L-chondrites. <clears throat> For some reason, the HD meteorites don't have any sodium in them. So whatever removed the sodium from the moon, removed the sodium from the HED parent body, we don't know what that is, but let's wave our magic wand to take an ordinary chondrite and get rid of the sodium. Then you've got your anorthite that makes up about 6% of it, diopsid about 2% of it, hypersine 42% of it. 33% of the mass of this body ought to be made out of olivine, and about 13% ought to be a mixture of iron and iron sulfide. And the density is a little bit more dense than Vesta, but, but maybe the surface got fluffed up and it's kind of porous. In any event, that much iron and iron sulfide should make a core with about 110 kilometers of radius. Okay. <clears throat> that big red line, is what the gravity people tell us is the range of core sizes 
versus core densities that fits the gravity data for Vesta. And that red spot is where the core ought to be if it was made out of L chondrite material. It doesn't work. If the core is a mixture of iron and iron sulfide in the same proportion as you find in the L chondrites, it ought to have a core of about 110 kilometers radius, and instead it's got one of around 140 kilometers radius. And we realize, of course, you know, that you, you, you <clears throat> volume grows as the cube of the radius. So that's a heck of a lot more iron. The core of Vesta is not the core of a chondritic body. And there's another problem. There is our wonderful picture of Vesta. <clears throat> Let me round out the bottom. There is the bit that was chipped off. And you see, ooh, ooh. That little bit of green peeking out the bottom is stuff that ought to be olivine, that ought to be visible. <clears throat> and we don't see that olivine. That's what ought to be visible today. But the modelers tell us that in order to have that much chipped off, the impact must have dug itself twice to a depth of about 85 kilometers. Look at all that olivine that ought to have been pulled out of Vesta. And at the very least, scattered on the surface so you could see it. And we don't see it. If you want to have an olivine mantle and you want to hide it with the crust, the crust would have to be 85 kilometers thick. Remember I said the crust was going to be about 20, no, 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 85. Now, <clears throat> this is a kind of a complicated figure. I didn't make it. This was the Dawn team making it, <clears throat> trying to prove a very different point. But <clears throat> these black lines are how thick, thick the crust would have to be to match the density <clears throat> of Vesta if it's got an iron core and a mantle. They wanted to make the mantle, you know, 3,200 grams per cc, but the, the density of olivine is more like 3,600 grams per cc, which means that the crust would have to be at least 60 kilometers thick <clears throat> to lower the density of Vesta enough to make it the density that we see today. Okay, the radius of Vesta is 262. That's 100% of the volume. The core is 140 kilometers, let's say, if it's a chondritic core. <clears throat> No, no, I'm not chondritic. If it's the core that has got a chondritic composition, but the size that the spacecraft told us, that's about 15% of the volume. The crust is anywhere from 60 to 85 kilometers thick. So it's from 50 to 70% of the volume of the planet. That doesn't leave any room for a mantle. You've got the core, you've got the crust, and then you got the mantle trying to sneak in there in the little gap that's left. So the model on the left is a body that would make basaltic achondrites. The crust is 25% of the mass. The mantle is rich in olivine. There's a little bit of a core. That will make you your basaltic meteorites, but that doesn't fit the dawn data. The thing on the right fits the dawn data. The crust is all 85 kilometers thick. It's got a really big core to match the gravity. <clears throat> the crust and the mantle densities match the, the density, but there's no mantle, essentially. There's only a little bit at most. I can make Vesta look like that, but it doesn't make, that kind of planet could not make basaltic meteorites. You need the olivine to make the basaltic meteorites. <clears throat> you need the olivine leftover if you know, you're starting with cosmic abundances because <clears throat> you need something out of which all of that aluminum could have been extracted to make the basalt. Vesta is covered with a great thickness of basaltic achondrites. We all agree. We knew that the first time we looked at it with the telescope and in a spectrograph, <clears throat> we knew that from dawn. Vesta today doesn't have the composition of a chondritic body certainly not one that would be capable of differentiating and making the basaltic achondrites, because 
if your, if your crust was chondritic, it wouldn't be thick enough to hide the olivine through the big holes that we see. If the core was chondritic, it wouldn't be big enough to match the gravity data that Vesta saw. And if you do have a core as big as Don said, then the crust has got to be really big to lower the density. And that means there's no room left for a mantle. Now the basaltic meteorites had to come from someplace. And that someplace, from everything we know about the chemistry of basalts and how they're put together, trace elements and major elements, they came from a body that melted, that had a composition that didn't look all that different from chondrites, didn't look all that different from the sun. That's where they came from. And Vesta isn't that body. So where did they come from? And for that matter, where did Vesta come from? What is Vesta if it's not a differentiated body covered with lavas? What happened to the 50 or 50,000 or whatever iron meteorite parent bodies? Where do we get palisites and meso mesosiderites from? Where do we get all those other rare meteorites from? Where are their mantles? Maybe there were lots and lots and lots of basaltic achondrite parent bodies. <clears throat> some with different, you know, slightly different compositions, some with different kinds of metal cores. <clears throat> They're all big enough that they could melt early in the solar system. They all differentiated and then they all started running into each other. <clears throat> Maybe you had a couple of iron cores run into each other and then bits of crust from the other guys that were busy breaking themselves up all fell on top of that iron core. Of course, then you got the problem, where did all the olivine go? Where did all the green stuff go? Maybe, this is even weirder, but I like this one. <clears throat> you start with something that isn't Vesta, but a lot bigger than Vesta. <clears throat> so big that its chondritic core is the size of the core that we see on Vesta today. And then, <clears throat> There was some enormous catastrophic impact <clears throat> that broke all of the rock off the surface. And then <clears throat> all of the crust material fell back on top of the core. <clears throat> the first one can make the basaltic meteorites. The second one is going to be smaller, about the size of Esta. It meets all the dawn tests. It has the same core size <clears throat> that. Uh, the big guy had. It has the same volume of crust that the big guy had. All you have to do is break it apart and then somehow magically make the olivine go away, make the mantle go away, make the green stuff go away. Yeah, that's the hard part. Before we even worry about where you get it, is this crazy? We do know that the basaltic meteorites formed really early on. We do know that was a time when Jupiter was moving back and forth and stirring up the asteroid belt and shooting most of it out so that what we've got left is, you know, one hundredth of one percent of the material that was originally there. We do know that there were a lot of parent bodies that melted and differentiated and made, gave us iron meteorites, but nothing else. We do know that irons and basaltic meteorites, stuff from the inside of one guy, molten, ran into stuff from the outside of a different guy to make them as the And we also know that whatever Vesta is, it's not a simple intact protoplanet because it doesn't fit the dawn data. So maybe this isn't such a crazy thing if only we can get rid of the green stuff. Well, as it happens, we have on Earth rocks called peridotites, which are a mixture of basalt and olivine. And, you know, most planetary scientists have looked through telescopes and they've looked at, uh, <clears throat> most of them actually haven't looked at rocks. When you hold one of these rocks and you set it on the ground, <clears throat> there's a beer bottle in the back of the picture, if you can see it kind of for scale. What you see is that the gray stuff is the basalt, the green stuff is the olivine. You set it on the table and the green stuff falls out of the rock. It's really loose. How come? Well, oddly enough, 
when this stuff crystallized, the basalt crystallizes into tiny crystals that interlock with each other really easily. The olivine, the mantle stuff, crystallizes into bigger crystals, but as they cool, they don't shrink isotropically. <clears throat> One side shrinks faster than the other. The bigger the crystal, the more stress this puts on them, and that means that the crystals then fall apart from each other. <clears throat> the crystals of the basalt, ironically, are smaller but stick together to make bigger intact lumps. The crystals of the olivine are bigger, <clears throat> but for that reason, when they cooled off and shrank, they fall apart from each other. Now, gravity in the solar system <clears throat> perturbs big things and small things alike. The old famous experiment of Galileo where he had the big rock and the small rock on the, the Tower of Pisa and he dropped them and they both fell at the same rate. Not sure he actually did that, but if he had done it, that's what he would have seen. Gravity will not separate dust from bigger rocks, but there are non-gravity forces also working in the early solar system. You've still got gas there. You've still got the gas of the solar nebula. <clears throat> Big things are going to be able to plow through faster than small things because they've got less surface area per mass. <clears throat> surface area goes as r squared, mass goes as r cubed. The bigger they are, the more mass, the more oomph they have to go through, through gas, <clears throat> whereas the smaller guys will be stripped away. Once the nebula gas goes away, then you have other perturbing forces. Um, the one that many of you probably know about is something called the pointing Robertson effect. You shine light on a piece of, of dust. And if the dust is small enough, the light has a pressure that will eventually push it out of the solar system. If it's a little bit bigger and it's spinning, the smaller guys can be perturbed by something called the Yarkovsky effect, the hot side he emits hotter energy photons than the, the cool side, and that will change. Basically, there are a lot of ways, if you have millions of years, to cause the olivine dust to go away and to make just <clears throat> the crusty stuff and the iron stay behind. So maybe that's what happened. Maybe something else happened. Maybe I haven't been you know, original enough. There could be scenario number three, invent your own. It could be all of the above. But what it does mean is that once upon a time, a long time ago, the suns and the planets were forming from a cloud of gas and dust. Jupiter forms first. As the other guys are starting to form, Jupiter's orbit moves radically across the asteroid belt, stirs things up, <clears throat> throws asteroids out, or destroys asteroids by having them run into each other. And Vesta is no different from any of the other bodies. The only thing different is that it appears to have been maybe big enough that it captured its core, <clears throat> that its core captured its crust while the olivine went away. That's my theory. Um, <clears throat> I'm showing that that guy in 1977, who was me, <clears throat> was completely wrong. But then if somebody's going to show that I'm completely wrong, I'd rather it be me than anyone else. That's how I think Vesta is telling us something about the chaotic and violent early period in our solar system's history. <clears throat> Thanks a whole lot for listening to me. If you want to know more about our work or actually anything else about the Vatican Observatory, go to the web, vaticanobservatory.org. And at that, <clears throat> I will stop the sharing and throw it open to questions. Thank you so much, brother Guy. Wow, never, never really knew so much about asteroids until now <laughs> and and vesta is uh i just uh, realized now that vesta is really a very weird uh, asteroid and we have some questions here uh, uh here is a uh, first question uh could the sodium in vesta gotten vapor vaporized by solar radiation in the same way that mercury sports the sodium pale where sodium is being blown away by solar radiation so could the sodium in Vesta Possibly, have yeah. been vaporized by right. solar radiation? Um, it would have to have occurred before Vesta was formed, because you would assume that the, the sodium <clears throat> was gone before the rocks melted and the crystals were formed. 
So it had to happen early on. And then if that happened, how come it only happened to Vesta and not to the chondrites? Uh, maybe there's an answer to that. <clears throat> maybe there is a way of doing that. Uh, the, the, really, the mystery of where did the sodium go is a mystery that also involves the moon. And because the moon is very sodium poor. Um, and there are a few other theories out there, but it might be due to the, the idea that you know the moon certainly was pulverized by the, the giant impact that you know formed the, the Earth Moon system. And maybe solar radiation there had something to do with getting rid of the sodium. I'm having a harder time picturing how that works for Vesta, but I hate to say no, it didn't happen. <laughs> There are other ways that people have tried yeah. to argue around it, but none of them are particularly elegant. On the other hand, it happened. So there must've been something that happened to cause it to happen. Thank you, brother Guy. Uh, there's a, here's a question from our Q&A box from Raymond Ang. Vesta seems to be a well-studied asteroid. Is there any avenue by which amateur astronomers can contribute to the study of Vesta? such as astrometry or photometry, or is it already a saturated area? <laughs> well, Vesta's fun because it's the one thing that amateurs with even a small telescope can see. I've seen it with my little C90, you know, into a three and a half inch. <clears throat> it's easy to study that way. Um, there's a lot of good science that amateurs can do <clears throat> about asteroids and maybe looking for the Vestoids. But Vesta itself, I, I have to feeling, yeah, because it's so bright and so easy to see, it is a pretty saturated field at that point. Um, yeah. Unless you're really clever and can come up with something that <clears throat> I haven't thought of. Thank you. Here are two related questions. What could have made Vesta unique among the minor planets? Could it have been the original inhabitant of, could it have been the original inhabitant of the asteroid belt and all the others are the result of collisions? And are there any other Vesta-like asteroids that have not that have been that has been detected? I think okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Though certainly there are a whole family of asteroids whose surfaces have the same spectrum as Vesta. They're all very small, and they all have orbits that can be arguably be traced back to the orbit of Vesta. So. It could well be that Vesta really is the source of these asteroids in that they started out in Vesta <clears throat> and before they became chipped off and came on their way to Earth. And obviously every meteorite in our collection, even if it came from Vesta, was an asteroid on its way from being on the surface of Vesta to being on, in our collection. So there's certainly lots of small guys like that. There are a few where the orbits can't easily be traced back to Vesta. And the people who want to insist Vesta is the source of everything have to wave their hands really, really hard. So hard that the wave, you know, the, the wind from waving their hands can blow away the, the olivine, I guess. <clears throat> the other question is actually pretty easy to approach from both a chemistry and a, a, a high school geometry point of view. You look at the size of Venus and Earth and you notice that Mars is a lot smaller. You can look up the numbers and say that, okay, it's half the radius or you know, third, third of the radius. <clears throat> but when you go with the cube, that's really a substantial amount of, you know, if, if the proto Mars were the same size as Venus and Earth, then somehow it lost, <clears throat> you know, 70 or 80% of its mass. If you took all of the asteroids in the asteroid belt, and piled them together into one body, it still wouldn't be <clears throat> any, any bigger than Ceres. It'd probably be you know, roughly the size of Vesta, maybe a little bit bigger. So much smaller than any planet that you know that 99.99% of whatever stuff should have made a body roughly the same size as Venus and Earth <clears throat> got lost. What we're looking in the asteroid belt is a really rare sample of stuff that just happened to be lucky enough to be in orbits that it survived Jupiter passing through the asteroid belt, scattering things away. <clears throat> so that means that you can't really look at Vesta as an original planet. It's way too small. 
Furthermore, remember what I was talking about oxygen isotopes and how you know the, the isotopes of one piece of, of Vesta, they're different from the Earth. And the different meteorite types are different from each other. And that means that there's not one parent body that all of the different meteorites come from, but they all came from maybe a limited, maybe a few hundred parent bodies that got broken up into the hundred thousand to million asteroids that are there today. But certainly there was never one giant planet that got broken up because such a giant planet would have homogenized the chemistry and the chemistry of the meteorites is not homogenized. <clears throat> it would have left behind a core a lot bigger than Vesta's core. <clears throat> the, the volume argument doesn't work and the chemistry argument doesn't work. And the fact that I've been able to reel this off means that it's not a stupid question. We had to sit down and think it through because it is a pretty, you know, pretty basic and good question to ask. Yeah, here's another, actually, uh, in a way, it's, it's uh, regarding again the, the, what Vesta is. Could Vesta be an escape body from the Jovian system of moons? Or is it the remnant that escaped being captured by Jupiter? Its orbit is far enough away from Jupiter and circular enough <clears throat> that it doesn't have the tracings, the trademark of an escape moon. But you hate to say nothing ever, you know, nothing, you know nothing's impossible. <clears throat> um, we do know what a rocky body near moon, near Jupiter would look like. Eo is our example. And the chemistry of Eo is very different from the chemistry of Vesta. But maybe Vesta could have come from, you know, in, originated as a, as a moon that was somewhere between Eo and Jupiter, <clears throat> a much higher region. Um, it's an original idea. If you wanted to write a science fiction story based on that, <laughs> I, would, I would read it. <clears throat> it wouldn't turn me off immediate, immediately. I, it's I, a pretty I, wild yeah. idea, but who yeah. knows? Like uh, Marooned Off Vesta by Asimov. <laughs> by Isaac Asimov, <laughs> exactly. Uh, here's another question. Uh, uh, this is about uh, uh, meteorites. Would there be a way of associating existing meteorites containing olivine with Vesta or perhaps Vesta-like asteroids? The way you would do it would be to look at the the trace elements that are left behind in the olivine, because if you assumed that you started with, you know, not only magnesium and, and silicon having the same proportions as in the sun, but you assume the rare earths are in the same proportion. You find all the rare earths are in the, the HED meteorites and the basalts, because they don't like to fit into the crystals of olivine. <clears throat> if you could find the traces in olivine that look like the residue of stuff that had melted and gone elsewhere, that's a good hint. Uh, a more obvious one is the iron to magnesium ratio. The, there is an iron to magnesium ratio in the pyroxenes of the uh, basaltic meteorites. And given what we think we understand about how this melt occurs, that implies a slightly different but calculatable iron to magnesium ratio in the olivine. And nobody's found an olivine that has that right kind of olivine to uh, iron to magnesium ratio that looks like it's a direct descendant of the basaltic meteorites. On the other hand, maybe our models are too simple and you know these things went through a few more processes and, and a little more refining compared to what we knew. But that's the kind of chemical arguments that you have to make when you've got the record rock in hand and you're saying, okay, what can I see in this rock? And is it the mirror image of what I see in the basaltic meteorites? So that when I put them together, I come back to cosmic abundances. So uh, I, I'm not sure if, if you've answered this already. Has there been any meteorites from Vesta that have been recovered on Earth? Well, all the meteorites, the HED oh, the meteorites yeah. are recovered on Earth. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so, so they, um, they, they originated from Vesta. Yeah. They, they probably, <laughs> they originated from a body that eventually became Vesta is the way I like to uh. say it. Oh. Vesta was a waypoint that probably kept them solid during the early solar system when everything else was being battered to bits. <clears throat> and out of that, um, 
you know, kept them around long enough that when something chipped them off uh, a billion years later, those rocks could float through space and eventually run into the earth. Thank you. And it's not an insignificant number of meteorites. It's about uh, 15, 20% of all the meteorites in our collection are these basaltic meteorites. Not a majority, but not insignificant. Question here is related to the, uh, the, term, the use of the term basaltic. Yeah. You use the term basaltic to describe meteorites. Does it, it mean they are of igneous in origin? That is, they form yes. from molten rock? Yeah. Doesn't That's exactly what that means. Vol <clears throat> volcanism? Uh, there must have been right. some kind of volcanism. There yeah. must have been some kind of volcanism on the surface. Um, the moon, you know, it's got these Mari flames. Those are basalts. It wasn't a big giant, you know, <clears throat> cone of a, of a volcano. Okay. It was melt from inside that seeped up to the surface. It might have been a process like that. But certainly it was some kind of melting of rock inside the body that <clears throat> caused the molt, you know, the melt was going to be lower density. And it's going to be squirted up cracks and find the surface. That's exactly what's going to happen. Yep. Thank you. And thank you for answering all of these questions. I wasn't expecting so many questions because of the technical Oh, these are good questions. Issues. But, <laughs> but uh, maybe I can ask our panelists now uh, if they want to ask questions. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, Edwin. Hey, guy. I actually have um, three questions for you. So um, first one, um, it's regarding Pluto. Uh, so, it, what is the uh, what can you say about the IAU's decision to mm -hmm. demote Pluto to a dwarf ah. planet? Are you in agreement with that? I hate that. I hate that phrase. Somehow, that implies that being a dwarf planet is less than being a planet, that somehow being a planet is better than being some other kind of object. You're guilty of planetism. But Okay, your yeah. laughter is completely appropriate, but yeah. I, it shows the emotional content of the question that has nothing to do with science. No, that, that, the reason for that. the IAU making the decision was we needed a sensible way <clears throat> of assigning who's going to name these guys, who's going to keep track of their orbits, who's, you know, what table are you going to put them in? It was an entirely practical decision. And as practical decisions go, I think it has stood the, the test of time very, very well. I, I mean, you know, I know people who disagree with me. They tend to be um, <clears throat> from a tiny corner of the field and very emotional, unlike me, I'm never emotional, heaven forbid. <clears throat> and um, you know, they, they don't understand that planetary science is more than just what they do. So that's I, my first. Okay, well, I guess the, uh, the, the, the issue is uh, it wasn't fully explained in clear terms to the public, especially. Uh, um, what, is, what is the definition of uh, a planet like a major planet and mm -hmm. a planet. So it seems but, like- Yeah, right. It, it's it's hard, because it's, it's difficult. It's, it's difficult to explain. Yeah. <clears throat> it was difficult to explain to some of the scientists. Uh, the, the, I was there at the, you know, when the decision was made, I was the secretary of the commission. I was taking the notes as people were, were debating it. <clears throat> I can show you the minutes. I can show you where the discussion went. And it was overwhelmingly favored by the scientists at the IAU. <clears throat> Um, it's really a question of trying to determine not only what it is, but how it behaves. You got to remember that Pluto is smaller than Mercury. Pluto is smaller than the Earth's moon by a lot. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Pluto, if you put it on top of the Earth's moon, <clears throat> would, you know, would, would barely hide a, a Mari, Mari region. It's a dinky little bit of fluff. The major planets each have orbits and their mass is enough that anything smaller that comes into their orbit is affected by them. <clears throat> Neptune controls the orbit of Pluto. 
if you were to nudge Pluto with an impact, Neptune will drag it back. If you were to nudge Neptune in some way, Pluto would be dragged along with it. <clears throat> Clearly, Neptune is something very different from Pluto in terms of the way it controls its orbit. <clears throat> so we've got at least three different types of stuff, not even getting to comets. You've got big guys that control the gravity in their region. <clears throat> what do you mean can control? What do you mean by region? All definitions are gonna be fuzzy. You've got guys that are big enough that they can pull themselves into spheres, but so small that they're still jerked around by the big guys. <clears throat> and then you've got the ones that are just piles of rubble. Now let's take Vesta as an interesting example. Is Vesta a pile of rubble or is it something that was pulled into a sphere? Because it's not exactly a sphere. It might have been that when it was melted, it was weak enough that it could pull itself into a sphere, but after it froze, it's not, you know, the gravity isn't strong enough that if you knock a, a hole in it, it won't flow back. Does that mean that for a while it was a planet and then it stopped being a planet when it got colder? You see the problems with trying to come up with definitions like that. And yet, this is the best we can do, just basically to, to sort out what toolbox should we bring to study this particular object versus that particular object? And if you bring, if you have the wrong definition, you'll bring the wrong toolbox and you'll probably miss something important that you hadn't thought to look for. I think even up to now, there's still some confusion, disagreement, even among- Oh, there's always, planets. oh, oh, yeah. <clears throat> and I can name the planet guys who are confused, they're friends of mine. <laughs> but what can I say? They're confused. Okay. Well, uh, thank you, Brother Guy. And my uh, other question is, um, uh, back in 1996, when Imelda and I were just, had, you know, just started working at uh, Sky Telescope, everybody got called, you know, all the editorial staff got called to a, to watch a NASA press conference when they announced uh, uh, a Martian meteorite found in the Allen Hills of Antarctica. ALH uh, 40, uh, 84001. 01. And yep. this uh, NASA scientists announced that they found some fossilized bacteria mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. the meteorite. Mm -hmm. So, what do you think of that um, thought of having microscopic life on meteorites? In that particular case, <clears throat> the answer, the, 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 the general consensus is maybe, but I'm not convinced. <clears throat> and the trouble is the lines of evidence are all sort of right at the edge of what we can determine. <clears throat> is it really what we think it is, or are we looking at the data and sort of half closing our eyes and hoping it's life? <clears throat> and everything that they found could be explained <clears throat> by some other system, some other uh, effect that had nothing to do with life. It's certainly intriguing. I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, 30, 50 years from now, when we finally have a lot of samples back from Mars, we will find fossilized bacteria and we'll discover that there was fossilized bacteria on Mars and that wasn't it. So you think that the jury is still out there? The jury is still out. Most people find it interesting, but they're not totally convinced. Oh, got it. But it really made big news during that. Time. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, because it was the best evidence to date of anything that could be that. Okay. Most of the other evidence, the jury is not out. We say, no, nah, not life. That one, there's still a hope. You know, maybe 5% chance that it is, which is better than zero. Got it. Uh, my last question, uh, if I may, uh, is um, you uh, talked about basaltic achondrites. Uh, how does... How do uh, carbonaceous chondrites fit into this scheme? The scheme. They're certainly not basaltic because anything that would melt a rock <clears throat> would vaporize the carbon. That's talking about those carbonaceous chondrites that actually have carbon. The, the phrase, the name carbonaceous chondrite is very unfortunate because there are a lot of carbonaceous chondrites that actually don't have carbon. They're not carbonaceous. 
but they have other trace elements that makes us you know, classify them in the same boat. <clears throat> and the ones that have the most carbon don't have chondrites, so they're not really chondrol, you know, don't have chondrols, so they're not really chondrites. But in any event, the ureolites, that kind of rare <clears throat> meteorite, some say look like what might happen if you had a carbonaceous chondrite and melted it. It's got a significantly different chemistry in terms of oxygen and, and other trace elements <clears throat> than the basaltic meteorites. But there could have been a body that made these. We're still arguing about where the ureolites come from. Thank you so much, Brother Guy. Oh, Imelda has a very technical question for you. We hope mm -hmm. you can answer it. It's it's really technical. Yeah, Brother Guy. 42. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, I hope you can really answer this question because it's very, very technical. Uh, how'd you get your t-shirt? The Manila Observatory t-shirt. The Manila Observatory t-shirt. <laughs> I believe that it was a gift from one of our summer school students. Uh, oh. Because every three, you know, every two years, five yeah. years thanks to COVID, but every two years we have a summer school. Yeah. And uh, on occasion, we'll have students who either have come from the Philippines or have spent time there, and we trade t shirts. So, ah, okay. Because you know how close the middle observatory Oh, yeah. Is. All right. Oh, yeah. And I've never been there. I would love to get there someday. Yeah. Yeah. Great. I'd love to see you. At least I can get there by Zoom. <laughs> Other yeah. questions? Yeah. Here's a question. Uh, is it okay, Melda? Sure, sure. Uh, this is a question from the uh, another type in question from uh, our attendee, Gilbert Moon. Uh, is there any other asteroids whose origin and evolution were well studied like Vesta? Nope. And basically, that's it. The closest would be Ceres, which uh, was also visited by a spacecraft. We have visited other asteroids with spacecraft. And we have a sense of, you know, what's there now. But they all look like they're piles of rubble of some other asteroid that broke apart and fell back together. And so that has wiped out the history of whatever is before them. Of the asteroids that have been visited by spacecraft, you know, they're only a handful. And we know a little bit more about them than we do more know about most of them. But it's very, I mean, Itakawa, though the Japanese imaged spacecraft that brought back dust from Itakawa. We know that it looks like L chondrite. We don't know that L chondrites come from Itakawa, merely that the same material that made Itakawa also makes this brand of meteorites, but they both probably come from someplace else. And we don't know exactly where that someplace else is. Thank you. Do, do we have other questions from our panelists? Uh, Jet, uh, um, yeah. I like to ask a curious question for Robert Guy regarding, of course, the the one uh, mentioned by Edwin a while ago about Pluto. Uh, how come uh, if it's just a dwarf planet, uh, as they describe? How come that? Well, here... it's the only it's the only one that has a has a satellites or moons that's orbiting uh, Pluto. Ah, uh, but it's not. We now know of half a dozen dwarf planets, and several of them have moons. <clears throat> okay. So uh, <clears throat> Makemake, I believe, is, is one in particular that has quite a well-studied moon. <clears throat> there, there was a point where it was doing uh, transits, and you could actually try to measure the size of it by how the, the light curve dimmed up and down. Part of the story of Pluto really is why did anybody think it was a planet in the first place? And that's very curious. Back in the 19th century, Uranus was discovered and traced and then its orbit followed for decades. And someone noticed that the orbit seemed to be a little bit different from what you would expect from just simple Keplerian laws, you know, the law of gravity. But you could explain it if there was another planet outside of Uranus perturbing it. And using their very good math, they calculated where that planet should be, they turned their telescope there, and they discovered Neptune. So having done that once, they thought, let's try it again. 
So for another 20 or 30 years, they very carefully measured the position of Neptune and tried to see, were there perturbations that might mean another planet? And one eager scientist thought he saw in the data the hint of a perturbation, predicted where you should look for it. And it took a whole lot longer looking before eventually um, um, the fellow, help me, the guy who discovered uh, Pluto, Clyde Tombo. <clears throat> Eventually, yeah. Clyde Tombo and his little telescope saw a body more or less where they expected to see one that appeared to move in an orbit that was outside of Neptune. And so he announced, aha, the guy who did the calculation was right because here's the planet. In order for the calculation to have been right, Pluto would have had to have had a mass 10 times the mass of Earth. And it would have had to have been much larger physically than planet Earth. But every time Pluto passed near a star where they thought it was going to blink out that star and we can finally measure how big it is, the star didn't blink out. And every time they had to re-estimate the size of Pluto, it kept looking smaller and smaller and smaller. Finally, in 1978, in some nice telescopic images, they realized Pluto had a moon. And when you look at the orbit of the moon, you can calculate the mass of Pluto. When you calculate the mass of Pluto, it's about a tenth of the mass of Earth's moon, not 10 times the mass of the Earth. Then somebody went and looked at the original data. Well, if it's not Pluto, what's perturbing Neptune? And the answer is nothing's perturbing Neptune. The guy was looking at errors in the data. So it was a case of somebody thinking they saw what they want to see rather than being really rigorous with the data. And the myth that Pluto was this body 10 times bigger meant it would have been a planet, but it isn't, and it isn't. What it is instead is actually a whole lot more interesting, just as I think the real Vesta is a whole lot more interesting than this intact protoplanet that they thought they were gonna see. <clears throat> but people are in love with seeing only what they want to see. Um, you know, it's it happens in human life. I don't know how many people I know, dated people who only see in the person they're dating what they wanted to see. <clears throat> and I'm so guilty of it that I'm a Jesuit now. So <laughs> it happens to us all. Thank you, brother Guy. Uh, Thank you, brother Guy. Yeah. Can, can, I, I'll read another question from, from the attendees. Uh, and this uh, is again uh, regarding meteorites. Uh, since olivine seems to easily fragment, would it be would it be we are not finding more olivine meteorites that they are is that they are fragmenting and burning up so much in the Earth's atmosphere they don't survive and reach the ground? Yeah, that's quite possible, and <clears throat> there's some evidence to that. Um, we actually see dust around other stars that has the spectrum of olivine, interestingly enough. <clears throat> and when we measure shooting stars, <clears throat> there are different chemical compositions we can infer from the light they give off <clears throat> and how quickly they are able to be slowed down. And some of them are consistent with olivine. So <clears throat> it's, it's not a slam dunk proof, but it actually is the very kind of thing that we're looking for and we haven't, you know, ruled it out. We can't prove it yet, but we certainly, it's its <clears throat> not that unusual. Do we have uh, other questions from the panelists? Yeah. Thank yet, you. Yeah. Not a question yeah. yet, but I just want to really, really thank Brother Guy for this very lively discussion. I mean, I was seeing Carl Sagan in him. Uh, <laughs> the, the way he was talking and presenting, it really engages people. Uh, Thanks. To, you, you know, Brother Guy, you were showing your passion, really, for, for what you do. Thank you so much for that. Thanks. And thanks for having me. Thanks for giving me a chance to talk about something I really enjoy talking about with a great audience of people with wonderful questions.
Yeah. And, and there's another thank you from uh, Marcia Burns Mittler. Uh, <clears throat> thank hi, you, Marcia. brother Guy. Good to see you. <laughs> okay. Bye bye. And uh, I, I, I read another question from Daryl Moon. What is your perspective on Planet X? Yeah. Let's see. I am, when it comes to that, I'm agnostic. It would be fun if we could see it. Um, once again, you know, the proof isn't solid, but if it's there, eventually we'll find it. Okay, uh, I guess uh, no more questions. Uh, thank you so much for answering patiently all of these questions, brother guy. Sure. <laughs> now, uh, before we, uh, no, I, we, I would like to take this opportunity uh, so thank you, uh, and allow me to present our uh, ALP Certificate of Appreciation for your talk. Thank you. And this certificate from the Astronomical League of the Philippines reads as, this certificate is presented to Brother Guy J. Consolmano, SJ, for his invaluable insights, experiences, and expertise shared with the participants of the online talk entitled Vesta in the Chaotic Formation of Planets, held as part of the ALP Astronomy Expert Speaker Series 2023. Given this 22nd day of July, 2023, signed by Mr. James Kevin T, President, and uh, yours truly, Dr. Jose Francisco Aguilar, Vice President. And before we let you go, brother Guy, may we have a group picture with you? Uh, James, uh, uh, can you take care of the group picture? I'll stop sharing. Uh, James, you're muted. Okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. Ready? Wait. Okay, ready. One, two, three. One more. One, one two, three. Okay, thank you. Oh, God. Are we good? Okay, good. Thank you again, brother guy. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you, brother guy. Guys. Thank you very much. All right. Keep looking I, really, up. I really love the t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, brother guy. And I hope you have a, a, a new edition of your book. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye brother guy. Right. Thank you. I think brother guy has two books. Uh, aside from the uh, turn left. left. There's right. uh, Would You Baptize an Extraterrestrial? Yes. There's a few other ones coming out too. So go go to your favorite bookstore. And if you see a book with my name on it, buy two copies. <laughs> I, I also, I'm also you reading can. now the 10 great, it's not the great questions. <laughs> That's I'm pretty it. sure Jet will be going to the, driving to the Manila Observatory <laughs> after this talk and trying to find a t-shirt yeah, right now. I'll, I'll buy one. <laughs> Excellent. And, and Jet, don't forget us. Yeah, thank you. Thing on the back, thank you. Wow. Oh, What's that? Thank you. It's uh, <laughs> great. Wow, it's great. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Okay. Bye bye. Okay. Bye bye. I'm bye gonna, guys. I'm gonna take off now. Talk to you yeah. later. Bye. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks to our uh, visitors. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So before we before we close today's webinar, I would like to thank all our attendees for joining us. We will be sending your certificate of attendance for today's webinar by email to all registrants who were able to join us today. As mentioned earlier, uh, actually this is the 70th webinar in our ALP Astronomers, Astronomy Expert Series since we started last year. Our uh -huh. first speaker was the late Dr. Jay Pasakov uh, last, on April 23, 2022. Our other esteemed speakers since then were Mr. Zort Levi, Mr. Joe Rayo, Mr. Fred Espenak, Mr. Robert Reeves, Mr. Ken Crawford, Mr. Dave Eicher, Professor Matthew Barlow, Mr. Scott Roberts, Father Christopher Corbelli, Mr. David Levy, Mr. J. Kelly Beatty, Imelda Joson, and Edwin Aguirre. Dr. Daniel Green, Dr. Heidi Hamel, Dr. Deborah L. Negrin, and uh, our speaker last month was of none other than Brother Robert McKay, and for today, of course, Brother Guy Gonsolmano. And we are so grateful to all our webinar speakers. 
who very generously gave their precious time to share their knowledge and expertise to the World Amateur Astronomical Community. We can never thank you enough. And uh, for those who miss all our previous ALP Astronomy Expert Speaker Series talks, you can view the video recordings of our past webinars at your convenience at our official ALP YouTube channel shown here. So just search ALP uh, uh, Astronomical Leagues of the Philippines uh, uh, official uh, YouTube uh, uh, channel. And uh, I would like I would like to I'm very happy you know, and I'm very proud to uh, uh, to announce that for our uh, next uh, speaker uh, talk, our next talk it will be held uh, on uh, August 12 uh, August 13 uh, Sunday uh, a.m. Philippine Standard Time and August 12 Saturday EDT and the topic is uh, that the talk is uh, entitled Searching for the Oldest Stars and Galax Galaxies, a Crash Course on Stellar and Galactic Archaeology. And uh, this is none other than the one of the uh, brilliant and upcoming Filipina astrophysicists uh, who is now studying for her PhD, uh, about to start her uh, PhD uh, at the University of Chicago, she's actually a graduate of the BS Physics uh, degree at the MIT. She is none other than Hilary Diane Andales. So looking forward to, to her talk on August uh, 13, Sunday, uh, Philippine Standard Time. So thank you, everyone. And uh, thank you, everyone. And uh, stay safe always. Uh, okay. Thank you, guys. I'll just... Uh, uh, put in the Zoom meeting, uh, our post-webinar Zoom meeting uh, link uh, after this. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Bye. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good night.